I had the romanticized vision of, uh, of owning a brewery. Didn't, didn't really know anything before I got in. I lived in the suburbs and I thought I knew Chicago, but I mean, I really didn't know Chicago. Like, you have to know it if you're gonna start a business and everything like that. I got around and kicked tires and went through a lot of buildings. But one of the things, I wanted to be close to, uh, to the center city. It really led me to Clybourne Avenue. Clybourne, at that time in 88, was, was empty lots and abandoned cars. You know, it was not Bed Bath & Beyond and brew pubs. It was, you know, in the shadow of a, a housing project and they were making crazy beer on site. And it was just such a gutsy thing to do just because it was what he wanted to do. And he had the vision that, you know, beer is going to be different, beer is going to change. So he, he built this company out of nothing in the time when nobody did that in an area which you, you would not want to walk through right now. But he did the ballsiest thing of, that I could ever imagine by, by taking, getting out of his corporate life and opening a brewery at a time when nobody did that. So uh, I jumped into the deep end of the pool and, and opened Goose Island. Growing up in Chicago, you're between Milwaukee and St. Louis, the two giant breweries in the world, and the thought that you can make local beer didn't enter my mind until uh, Goose Island opened its pub in 88. It's amazing. Back then, you you know, you had to struggle to find a restaurant with any micro brews or, or even bars. You know, there were only a few, like the Map Room, the Hop Leaf. Yeah, we sure they could count the number of breweries on one hand in Chicago. Yeah, and you can count like the number of good craft beer bars with two hands, three hands maybe. You know, obviously like early on the pub, you know, it was the place where creativity flourished first and they really showed that people uh, had a taste in Chicago for all different kinds of styles of beers. Goose Island, especially the Clybourne uh, location, was the epicenter of all kind of things going on in beer. You, I mean, even before I came to Goose as a home brewer, every time I came to Chicago, I'd show up at Clybourne and taste through all the beers and take notes and take that back home. We were very lucky that we got adopted early on by the Chicago Beer Society because they were around since I think 77. They were just so excited that we were making um, not one or two but like five different kinds of beer. I mean the pub was pretty much the benchmark for brew pubs as far as I was concerned and then once the bottling facility opened at on Fulton Street and we were able to start distributing beer out out of the Chicago land market and out of state it just started kind of expanding people's minds on the different styles of beer that are out there. The size and scale of the Fulton Brewery was a pretty big leap at the time. People were doing it elsewhere around the country, but no one in, around Chicago is, did anything resembling that still. I, mean, I worked under Matt Brindelson at, at Fulton Brewery, the, the Brindelsonian era, as I like to refer to it. I'm probably one of the very few of Goose Island's production brewers who can make the claim that Greg Hall taught me how to brew. And that experience has been about as valuable as it comes. In the early days, there were very few of us their orders were well beyond what we were staffed to complete as brewers, so we were brewing pretty extensive days. Those were formative years because when you go from being a brew pub to a 25,000 barrel a year craft brewery, it's trial by fire, it's game on, and every day we were learning first by making mistakes and then trying to improve the process day in and day out. The halls provided this kind of once in a lifetime opportunity to work in a modern brewery with an unsatiable demand for products and a real desire to make classic examples and to also kind of break through and make new beers for a you know blossoming craft beer scene. The biggest innovation is uh, barrel aged beer. I mean that's a Chicago, that was invented in Chicago by Greg Hall. So all these barrel aged guys out there, I don't know how many of them know this, but that was invented in Chicago. We were coming up on our 1,000th batch of beer. I was trying to figure out what to do, and we got asked by a restaurant in South Bend, Indiana, to participate in a beer, bourbon, and cigar dinner. All I remember was I got to sit next to Booker No, who was the master distiller at uh, Jim Beam, and we talked all night long about beer and bourbon 
But I did get six bourbon barrels from him. I said, okay, we're gonna make the biggest stout I can make and put it in bourbon barrels and see what happens. And I didn't know if it was gonna turn out good or not. I was a little worried about it, frankly. We sent it out to Great American Beer Festival. We put it in the category of Imperial Stout and uh, we got disqualified because it was too big and too strong and bourbony and barely, and nobody had ever made a beer like that before. It was another year or two before uh, barrel aged beers made their entry into the Great American Beer Festival and to, to this day, they're the biggest category. What is now Matilda and what is now Père Jacques were pub recipes and uh, the pub didn't have the capacity to do what we can do at, at Fulton and didn't use Britannomyces and wild yeast. But basically we took some recipes and some ideas from the innovation at the pub, brought them back and basically stripped them down and rebuilt them. Matilda is probably one of the first ones I really said, wow, we're doing something really new and really excited a lot of folks. Juice really wasn't afraid to try anything. So oftentimes it just felt like um, you, know, you were writing the instruction manual for things. Things like using kombucha and really alternate fermentation uh, organisms was kind of bizarre and unheard of, at least for me. You learn really quickly that you always have a, a project in your back pocket that's ready to go. You never know when somebody's gonna come up and say like, we have a hole in the schedule, what can we fill with it? Like, oh sweet, well, let's do this. Having those experiments, those times when the brewers can be free, can play with what they want, can create whatever flavors or styles um, that they're inspired by, and that's really how you develop as a company. You keep your brewers happy, you let them experiment with new things, and, and every once in a while, you'll have just this amazing beer that comes out of it. It doesn't have to be brewing styles that have already been created. It could be brewing with tea, or brewing, brewing with alternative yeast strains, or different brewing processes altogether. That way of continuing to push the boundaries to always learn what can be done with beer, not what necessarily has been done with beer. I think Goose Island IPA is probably my personal crowning achievement relative to formulating a beer with Greg and then seeing it all the way to fruition and then in 2000 uh, it winning the gold medal at GABF in its respective category. Well, actually the big one is 312. Um, we were phasing out uh, Goose Island Pills and after a meeting Greg said, you know, we're taking, we're getting rid of a uh, Pilsner. My idea to replace the Pilsner is a light unfiltered wheat ale. I want a hazy beer, but not from uh, yeast and kind of citrusy. That was the entire direction. And from there, I did some investigation, talked to some of my Maltster friends and came up with 312, the recipe. I was in the cellar when we were developing Matilda. So I, uh, I was the cellarman uh, that had to deal with the Britannomyces, which we were all really green uh, as far as using. So we kind of came up with a sanitation program that uh, pretty much consisted of me cleaning a tank for eight hours. So Matilda was, uh, was by, by far my favorite beer to make there. One of my proudest moments of being at Goose Island was uh, coming up with, with uh, Juliet, which was the, the first innovation beer from the newly formed innovation team. A lot of to play around with some things we had never done at uh, Goose Island before. We brought in uh, some wine barrels, uh, started aging in wine barrels in addition to the uh, to the bourbon barrels. You know, we didn't know what the end result was going to be, and luckily it turned out to work out pretty nice. Yeah, Madame Rose, um, you know, started off uh, as, as a Greg Hall idea that uh, you know he asked me to help execute. You know, I formulated the base beer for that, and the idea was to age that in wine barrels, sort of like make an oud brune, and uh, use a suite of different organisms. You know, we also added uh, some sour cherries to that beer as well, and it made a really great tasting beer. People who work at the brew pub, you know, got the experience of uh, creating a lot of different beer styles and we had you know good sanitation and you know we give people a good base then when they went over to production and they're doing a lot of things multitasking and doing all that kind of stuff I mean that really sets people up to go anywhere and they have and they make great beer. It seems like Goose Island is like the staging ground for uh, brewers that go off and do really great things. I think part of it too is their willingness to train people that have absolutely no experience. <laughs> have never been anywhere, you know, and either have had no professional brewing experience or, you know, maybe schooling or just out of brewing school. But I know almost everyone that I worked with 
During that period, they had never worked in a brewery before. Every day was a learning period. Goose Island is basically the Midwest Brewing School for, for me, for a lot of breweries. Obviously, there's, there's been a lot of great brewers that have come through Goose, and I think a lot of that had to do with Stiebel being there, so they had a, a good pick. It's probably hard to imagine now when you see how successful Goose Island was, but we literally were teaching ourselves how to brew in those days based on the Siebel textbook. We all learned together and stuck to the roots of brewing and then took that knowledge to our respective places where we sit now in the brewing industry. You know, over the last 25 years, we've had a lot of great brewers here, and when the first couple ones left us for other opportunities, I really felt bad that I wasn't able to convince them that their best opportunity was to stay here. Then I understood that, not unlike what I did, is I went off and started something. Many of them wanted to have different opportunities, and we gave them a platform to go off and do all those things. So. Uh, today I take great pride in the fact that we've got brewers in many of the best breweries today and more than a couple of them have started their own breweries. Yeah, I was kind of joking about that, that Goose Island is really like the Isaiah Thomas of the brewing industry. Like we got kids everywhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, and they're all talented as well. I don't know about his kids, but the Goose kids are all talented. God, I have to pinch myself. I have to pinch myself that, uh, you know, making beer in Chicago, Illinois is probably about the best thing in the world. There's nothing quite like making a product that other people like. John Hall, without him, we would not be where we're at now. I think Craft Brewing would have come to Chicago eventually, but John Hall was a leader in bringing forth and encouraging it to grow. Chicago craft beer, would be very far behind if it were not for what John did. It introduced the entire Chicagoland area to craft beer for the first time. I think what he did was create, you know, create a monster, uh, a great monster. Uh, and he employed a lot of people and it brought a lot of standards to the craft beer industry in Chicago. He built a great brand first and foremost, and then he took that and figured out how to replicate it and still maintain quality, integrity, and built a true national brand out of something that started in a little brick building on Clybourne Street. I couldn't have remotely dreamed that we'd be selling Goose Island in all 50 states. My dream was to, to be able to sell beer in Chicago and make Chicagoans proud of, of Goose Island. Looking back at it now, I think uh, a lot of a lot of people that have worked here, um, that have moved on, uh, will look back at us and think like, wow, we're actually progressing and moving forward and not, you know, making same average beers day in, day out. We're coming up with new things. We make the best beer that we can and really great and innovative beers. And we try to not repeat ourselves, which is a lot of fun because it adds new challenges and keeps something out on the market that's fresh. One of my passions here at Goose Island is to uh, do a lot of barrel work, whether it's through wine barrels or bourbon barrels. We haven't stopped producing barrel-aged beers at all. We're actually gaining more and more barrels. We're up to, I think, 5,000 barrels this year, whether it's uh, bourbon barrels or wine barrels. I'll continue to be on that side of the project. That's what makes me come into work every day. And we have a, quite a few new guys now. We train them the way we were trained. That tradition continues to go throughout Goose's history and will in the future. I really grew up at Goose Island and I really formed who I am at Goose Island. And it will always be part of me. My relationships with people that I've met at Goose Island are great and long lasting. What I've learned about brewing and people in Chicago and beer will never be forgotten. Goose Island, for me, will always be we and us, and I'm proud of that.
you can count the list of brewers that have left Goose Island who become brewmasters or open their own brew pubs all across this country. Worked with Jason Neaton, who's a great, who's the first microbiologist at Goose Island. Matt Brindelson, obviously. I mean, he's probably the best brewer in the entire game, in the entire world, as far as I'm concerned. You've got Jim Seebeck, Greg Brown, Josh Dee. Bill Wymore, perennial, great brewer. Will Turner, with, uh, he had Ryan Thompson as his assistant at the pub for a while, and then Jared Rubin. John J. Hall, there was uh, Matt Brennan. Frank Lassandrello is opening his own place. Andy Coates is opening his own place. Matty Kemp, Chris Bird. Patrick O'Neill, uh, Joel Becker, Keith Gavin, all these guys started on weekend shift. Ben Demink from Southern Tier. Zeke, who's at Bells. Ken Sherwinski. John W. Mr. Tom Quarter. Andy Ellis, John Laffer. Gary Nicholas. Andy Jones. Little Will Johnson. Jonathan Cutler. How can I forget Jonathan Cutler? Matt Lincoln. Tim Geppinger. John Mangy. Holy cow. 